Hi there, my name is Josh and thanks for joining me today. I want to make a brief introduction to motherboards before we really get into the details and just kind of give an overview of a motherboard and all the components that are on it. Every computer has a motherboard and that motherboard usually has the chipset which is going to determine a lot of other things on your computer. So there are some basic functions that have existed on nearly every motherboard for the past ever. These include, but are not limited to the following. To start, we have the chipset. This in modern forms might be called the platform controller hub as dubbed by Intel. This can be thought of as a handler to handle communications between high speed devices such as your CPU, RAM, and PCI Express, all of which are clocked really fast and kind of exist in their own environment, you could think of it. And then the chipset is the kind of the negotiator to handle signals coming from your SATA, your USB, your audio, your ethernet. Maybe you have legacy connections like PS2 for your mouse and keyboard. So it's going to take all that lower speed stuff and act as a in-between between your CPU and your RAM. Um, basically one chip is managing all these functions and that is a chipset. A chipset is going to also going to determine what processors and what RAM and what stuff you use within your motherboard. The one thing that the chipset does is it handles communications, the initial communications between your BIOS or the EOFI system. This is a basic system. It has its own chip on the board. It's connected to the chipset and this chip handles all of the basic talking to the devices. So Windows 10 might want to talk to your USB devices. It needs a uh, translator basically to translate, you know, copy file to send bit one, send bit two, send bit one, and so forth. This is the underlying application that kind of handles all that connections in the computer. Another overlooked component that not a lot of people talk about, but I believe it is important is the VRM and basically the general power routing of your motherboard. Every motherboard is going to have like a 24 pin connector and then like a four or eight pin 12 volt CPU connector. And that's how power gets to the board. It generally comes in 12 volt, 5 volt, and 3.3 volt. There are lots of electrical components that serve to either split up, to filter, to regulate this power into a stable source for sensitive components such as RAM and CPU. So the CPU cannot deal with a voltage spike of 3 to 3.5 without freaking out. It has to have some sort of program some sort of chip dedicated to regulating it and providing it a consistent voltage. And this is done with a collection of components. First, you have the voltage regulator module. This is a chip in and of itself. It controls how power is going to be delivered to your CPU. And it has its own capacitors, transistors, and what's called a choke. And that whole system is going to regulate power to your CPU. There's a separate system for RAM. There is also a separate system for your chipset. So next, we have the real-time clock. This contains a IC chip, integrated circuit chip, it contains a quartz crystal, and it contains a battery. This allows your system to consistently record and keep track of the time. This also keeps settings for the BIOS UFI system, and if you are ever overclocking your system and you need to save those settings, this is the circuit that keeps those settings saved so you can use them next time. This can also be used for diagnosing troubleshooting a, a computer. If you take out the battery and put it back in, it resets those settings, obviously. Removable storage slots. Hard drives and storage have always gotten their own connectors, and that's been like from IDE to SATA to PCI Express, and now in its, it's in that M.2 interface that we typically see on boards now. Just know that there is always a thing for storage. RAM. These are very distinct. They always have the same like long shape and this is where you put your RAM sticks. Audio. This is more of a recent thing and by recent I mean like 20 years but it's still a thing. The audio on your motherboard is separated typically from other components to protect it from interference. If it is near components like the CPU or the RAM it will pick up a lot of that electrical noise and stuff will just sound bad. So you'll usually find it located in the bottom left of the board. Ethernet and network. This is how your device talks to the outside world. This could be expressed as a wireless LAN chip. It could be expressed as a LAN chip. And the LAN chip is usually its own thing. It has to deal with a 
regulating a different kind of clock cycle than the rest of your computer, so it has buffers and stuff. It's its own integrated circuit, and you can usually find it near your RJ45 jack. Another thing is the Ethernet. This is where you plug in the internet. This might be expressed as a wireless card as well. Just know that it will have its own separate chip. This is due to specialized network functions, and it wouldn't be a great idea to integrate that onto a lot of other packages or the chipset itself. So it's its own chip. You can usually find it near the Ethernet port on the back of your computer, near the rear I.O. So the rear I.O. is also my next thing. It, every computer has this place where you just plug in stuff, and it's right on the board. It's right there. So you here you'll find your USB ports. If you have integrated graphics, it'll be HDMI, VGA, or display port. There will be, you know, of course, the audio jacks, and then the internet jack will also be there. And if your chip supports PS2, which is a very older legacy connector, you'll find it on there as well. Now, there are some other new ones coming out, such as USB-C and USB 3.1. Now, there are pinouts for other I.O., such as if you have a front panel audio, if you have USB on the outside of your case, or if you have a power button, which chances are you probably do. Now, there are pinouts, usually on the bottom part of the board, that will connect two devices that are meant to be, you know, kind of a hub for that stuff as well. A big component is going to be PCI Express. PCI Express is where you put your graphics card. It's where you put your network cards. It's where you put any kind of storage controllers or any other expansion cards into your motherboard. It will usually fit in here. This is, PCI Express is really fast and it can handle a lot of things. And the last part, but certainly not the least, is your CPU socket. This is very manufacturer independent. By that, I mean Intel or AMD. Uh, it's going to determine the types of processors you can put in there, along with your chipset and along with the general construction of the board. It usually has its own holes or a bracket for a heat sink to kind of screw into the motherboard or it supports a fact plate. The idea is that cooling is also given some thought here. So these are the basic core functions that you'll find on any motherboard for the past 30 years, basically. Definitely worth it to keep an eye out. And if you're looking for something particular, definitely look into that. So if you have like an Intel Core i9, you need a good VRM to power that. If you have a PCI Express Gen 4 ready card, find a board with a PCI Express Gen 4. It's important to know these features when you're dealing with other parts because it's always a compatibility thing. If we're honest, it's compatibility. It's got to be compatible with your case, your RAM, your CPU, your hard drive. All of that has to fit in and work with your system. So I hope this video helped explain what a motherboard is. And I don't want you to look at it and think, wow, there's so much stuff going on there. I want you to easily be able to look at one of these and be able to understand this is a RAM, this is a power, this is a CPU socket. This is the VRM up here. This is PCI Express. This is a storage slot here. This is... USB, this is front panel audio down here, this is SATA ports, this is, uh, this should be simple to look at for you. So for a motherboard, instead of thinking it as just one board, which it is, think of it as the separate components that make up this board. You can think of it as your chipset, you can think of it as your RAM and your RAM slots and your socket and your PCI Express slot. So all of these different components all magically melded on one board make up the motherboard i hope that was a good introduction for you guys i hope you learned something and i want you to be able to see these as a lot more simpler and not terrifyingly complex full of all these different components just break it down and take it a piece at a time try to look at oh what's going on here why why is all these here and look at different motherboards and you'll definitely see some patterns as well so thanks for watching and have a good day Hi there, today I want to talk about motherboard form factors. This is the size of a motherboard and is going to explain the some of the standards of this and how this is different from this. So they're both motherboards, they both have a standard. I want you to be able to identify that this is a micro ATX and this is the ATX, among other things. So I want to start off with a story. Back when I was growing up, my friend had this Dell XPS 
435T slash 9000. If that doesn't mean anything to you, just know that it was big and it was fast. We love this thing. It had a Core i7, had a Radeon HD 4850 or something. I don't know. It was huge. It weighed over 25 pounds. So come time where I finally was able to open the lid on this thing, I saw something weird and just something was off. I couldn't put my finger on it. I really couldn't. Then, about 10 years later, someone brought this same computer into my shop, and I saw it right away. The motherboard that was in this was a non-conforming motherboard. It was a proprietary format developed by Dell. Now, when I say non-conforming, I mean that it didn't fit into ATX standards, it didn't fit into BTX standards, it was just kind of its own thing. And that motherboard was only compatible with that case, made by Dell, and there was no way I could have upgraded this computer for this client because it just wasn't possible. Not that I needed to anyways. I had a good i7, still good today. So let's start back when form factors first came around. Back in the 1980s, IBM started its first mass marketing of a computer, a personal desktop system. It was just called the PC. And the way that motherboard was made became the PC standard. And when I say standard, I meant that the standard was the board had to be this long, the screw holes had to be here, 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 in relativity to another. This standard set out where to put stuff and why. So the CPU was here because better airflow. The slots were over here because that's where the back of the case was. This is, in essence, what a motherboard standard, standard is. It is defining where stuff goes and it's important to follow that because if you make a non-conforming motherboard, you might not be able to find parts that are compatible. You might not be able to find a case that's compatible or even a power supply that is compatible with it. So there would be a few more standards such as XT, AT, LPX, NLX, WTX, and BTX. The idea is that there was always these evolving standards as components changed and the general PC market changed, these form factors changed as well. It's great to have a standard, that way you can easily buy a motherboard for your computer that say maybe was made by a different manufacturer, but we know that these motherboards will be compatible. So there's a lot of motherboard factors that have come and gone, and there's a lot of reasons for that. One is we don't use the same components that we did 20, 30 years ago. We don't use ISA cards, we don't use PCI cards, we don't use um, IDE connectors and the idea is that there are different things and we've adapted to that. The next thing is we were able to make smaller components. We we're able to make smaller motherboards as a result of that and there is a demand for smaller computers. No one wants a giant 40 pound IBM computer on their desk when they can get a simple 10 pound desktop and it works. There are some standards that tried to come into being, such as the BTX standard, as you all might be fond to remember. It came and went really quick, and the idea was someone tried to improve upon it, but it just didn't work and the industry didn't pick up with it. So it never formalized itself as, a, as an industry standard. So nowadays we have the long-standing ATX standard, ATX is the elephant in the room that we have to talk about. The first revision specifications were published back in June of 1995 by Intel. And nowadays there are four major revisions or four different types of it that we use in most computers. This is gonna count for most desktop systems. And that is ATX, that is mini ITX, there is micro ATX, and then there is extended ATX. All four of these have different use cases. So ATX might be used for your typical gaming build where you want a lot of features and you want, you might want a lot of expandability, lots of ports. Micro ATX is what I use in my systems. I build for the small office, home office, where the system is generally going to remain the same for the rest of its lifetime. It possibly has some expansion for a PCI Express graphics card, but that's kind of the limit of what you're working against. Next is mini ITX. These are very small toaster-like PCs. That's not to say they're not powerful though. It's just really tiny, really compact, and you're limited to about one PCI Express 16 lane slot. Enough for a graphics card and maybe some storage. These PCs are usually built and not much changes with them for the rest of their life, simply because there's no space to add. There is no space to add more RAM, there's no space to add a second graphics card, etc. And the last one is extended ATX. 
This is what you'll find in a lot of servers. So it does follow that ATX where the screw holes are, but the motherboard is allowed to go in deeper, i.e. The, the depth of it from the rear IO back is allowed to go back further. And these are usually case specific. You'll find a lot less standardization here as these boards are usually custom made. There's not a lot of them made. They're made for the server environment. They're made for the high performance computing environment. And given that some of them can support two CPUs and lots of RAM. So you'll find a lot of proprietary and very highly specific applications with extended ATX, not what you'll find in your typical gaming build or your home office build. If you look on Intel's website, they have a lot of specifications and design uh, criteria and just suggested practices if you're into designing motherboards or trying to understand exactly how long the ATX standard is. This is usually a good resource to go to. And of course, there's other stuff like Wikipedia and um, there's some third party sites that will explain some specifications of it. These specifications are super important to design for to ensure maximum compatibility with any components you might be designing for it or wanting to be accepted within it. And also to ensure that there's maximum product acceptance within the market. If no one has a case for your motherboard form factor, no one's gonna buy it. This happened with the BTX standard about 14 years ago. When you buy components for your motherboard, it's super important that you find stuff that is compatible. Find a graphics card that is compatible. Find a graphics card that is going to fit in your case. Find RAM that's gonna fit on your motherboard. Don't buy laptop RAM, buy desktop RAM. It's important that you find a CPU cooler that is going to be compatible with your motherboard. It's going to find important, it's going to be important to find a CPU that's going to work on your motherboard. So there's lots of different components. The motherboard connects everything, so it's important that everything is compatible. Form factors is just one thing among many other things that you have to look at when finding and buying and selecting and designing PC systems. So I hope this video has taught you something about form factors and it's important that you see the specification and understand it. And if I was to leave some parting personal advice from this, it's it doesn't matter how big your motherboard is. Uh, a lot of gamers think that they need a huge motherboard. You can actually find high performance small boards such as a mini ITX board to run your Ryzen 9 processor, your Intel Core i9 processor. It's not the size that matters and you see a lot of gaming desktops are just huge. It's not needed. You can get high performance in small form factors. This is a kind of an old myth that I've heard a lot of people talk about. So I hope this video has taught you about form factors. Leave a comment in below if it has and like and subscribe. Please. Bye. Bye. Hi there. My name is Josh and thanks for joining me today. I want to talk to you guys about a better way to build computers. Something that is more thermal efficient, as in it can get rid of heat better, it's better laid out, it's cheaper to make, and you can make stuff smaller in it as well. This might sound too, big, too good to be true, but I'm, I swear it's a thing. It's a thing. So, this all starts back in 1995. It was about 24 years ago. The ATX standard was made and published by Intel. ATX stands for Advanced Technology Extension, and it was a specification on how to build computers. This specification applied to motherboards, as in where the pin out, pinouts would be, where the I.O. would be, where the power connectors would be, what kind of power connectors there would be, and how far and how wide the board would go within the case. This would also define where the heat producing components were at, such as the CPU, the North Bridge, and any kind of graphics expansion cards. I want to explain the time frame of when this standard came out, the new one, the revolutionary one I'm going to tell you about. It was back when Vista was coming out, the long awaited operating system with a revolutionary new world class UI brought to the home user. It would have a search function, indexes, it would have tons of new new things to make life easier and provide maximum compatibility with backwards programs. Looking at you, Vista. We were transitioning from DDR to DDR2 RAM with faster and more bandwidth to load in programs. There was SATA ports getting on all major motherboards. 
this would be bring in SATA hard drives and eventually SATA optical drives. And there was also the invention of the faster and more bandwidth heavy PCI Express. Another hugely notable thing and a, a big reason of why we're going to this design here is back in the early 2000s, AMD unveiled its first truly dual core processor to the mass market. Now we could say that IBM made it first, but AMD brought it to the home user. Now I actually had one of these chips. It was a AMD Athlon X2 64 uh, 3800 plus. This was a dual core processor running at two gigahertz. That was fast at the time. Considering that the system shipped with Windows XP, it was more than enough to get the job done. This processor was also really hot and really inefficient at what it did. It had a thermal design point of 89 watts. And the line to follow it that was in the making, Bulldozer by AMD, it was rated at over 100 watts. That's a lot of heat in such a small form factor. There was also that graphics cards were amping up their heat production with multiple cores and more RAM and just more complex circuits. And we also had chipsets that were stuck in between generations. Some of these even had to maintain compatibility with PCI and PCI Express at the same time. They had to deal with floppy disk as well as SATA hard drives. These chips were really inefficient and had to do a lot of different things, which made them produce more heat. The industry as a whole was looking for a hero to save the day. And that hero was the BTX standard, the Balance Technology Extension. This was a new specification on how to arrange the motherboard and the case and the fans and all of that to create a more efficient design. It even gave suggestions on where to put the chipset on the motherboard. All of these led to more efficient and most notably a straight airflow path through the chassis leading to a better power efficient and thermal design. The main early adopters of this standard were Dell and Gateway respectively. These companies had a lot of incentive to buy into the BTX standard. This was due to the cost saving design and the price competitive markets that these companies were in. With better airflow and less complex heat sink design, this led to a case that often only had to use one fan. The design and its adoption were both dropped in 2007. This was due to components becoming more power efficient. Some legacy standards such as ISA and floppy disk were just put to the wayside and processors were made on a smaller manufacturing process, which allowed them to be more efficient and either create more clock cycles for the same amount of heat or create less heat for the same amount of clock cycles, which was usually what happens. The BTX design was used in the consumer and business class desktops. The design can easily be recognized by the rear IO being on seemingly the opposite side of the case. Also on the outside, there is a iconic square on the middle of the front of the case. And this was to allow a big, usually 120 millimeter fan to pull in air and push it through the case in an efficient manner. When you pop open the lid, you see a widely different design with hard drives, hard drive bays on the bottom. The BIOS seems to be in its own dark corner overshadowed by a very large plastic cover shroud for the processor. This was to better allow airflow to push in there and not be kind of spread out in the case. You'll also notice that the heat sinks at this time were massive. They were huge. And right beside the processor is our north bridge and our south bridge at the time. And you will also see that the RAM and the power were on the kind of the top of the board. These boards were also one of the most compatible boards for anything at the time. They would have floppy disk support. They would have IDE support. They would have SATA. They would have PCI. They would have PCI Express. They would have PCI Express X4, X2, X1, and X16. Some of these systems are even still around in the case of the business and the server level environments where systems were made to last. In fact, last year I was able to work on one of these systems. I upgraded it to a Xeon chip. I put in eight gigabytes of RAM and I generally maxed out this system to make sure that it would last as long as possible. It was one of the few survivors though. At this time there was what was called the capacitor plague 
It's something that happened between 1999 and 2007, somewhere in there. It was a case of the, the capacitors that shipped on the motherboard, and a capacitor is just an electrical component, one of, the, one of the many on your motherboard. These components would, they would pop, they would leak, they would generally stop working after a few years. This affected a lot of computers at the time, and coincidentally, the capacitor plague ended in 2007, and it makes these computers a rare oddity to see nowadays. In fact, I got a computer in 2005. It was a Gateway Media Center PC. It had a embedded NVIDIA GeForce 6150 SE, and I was able to play Elder Scrolls IV Oblivion the hottest game at the time for its great level of detail graphics implementation on the PC market, had great open worlds, and, well, yeah, the chip kind of made the world less open for me. But anyways, I wanted to say that this PC, it worked, and it worked up until 2009 when a capacitor blew on the board. It would no longer post. It could no longer successfully start up, and we just had to get a new PC. So rest in peace, Gateway Media Center, 2005 to 2009. Miss you. So I hope this video taught you about the BTX standard, the Balanced Technology Extension. And if you ever, if you guys ever see one of these computers out in the wild, I, I definitely want you to take a look at it, tear it apart. And if you can't find one, just look up some images. You'll see that it was radically different, even though it looked very similar. So thanks for watching. Drop a like, subscribe, have a good day, get the discussion going. Have you guys had one of these? Okay, bye. Hi there, my name's Josh, and today I want to go over every single connector on the motherboard. This is going to cover the internal connectors and not the external rear I.O. So we're going to go over everything here and like just pay a lot of attention down here where there's a lot of stuff going on actually. And I want you to, to, at a glance, understand this and not perceive it as just plastic and metal being barfed all over the board. And if you don't know what's going on, that's kind of what it looks like. So we're going to get into this and just go over step by step, go over each one. This isn't going to be a fully inclusive list. There are some motherboards that have very specific server environment connectors. There are some motherboards that have very proprietary connectors, such as in very ultra small form factor machines. This is going to cover basically the 99%. So let's get into it. We're going to start with power. The most notable one here is the 24 pin motherboard power connector. This is going to be a mixture of 12 volts, 5 volts, 3.3 volts, and a couple signal wires. This is the component that supplies nearly all of the power to all of your motherboard components, such as RAM, chipset, PCI slots. Um, we have some audio and onboard LAN somewhere up in there. And the idea is that this, this connector is going to power all of that. The next one is going to be our 4 or 8 pin power connector for the CPU. This is a dedicated line specifically for the CPU. It is going to feed into this power circuitry here and then is going to go into your socket. The idea behind this is it is its own power source. It's not going to have any interference when, with any other sources. It's not going to have to compete with anything else. This 12 volts is specifically for your CPU. And that comes in handy when you're looking at overclocking or just generally higher power CPUs. And the last thing as far as power is concerned is I want to go over our CMOS battery. I call this an IO because you can take out the battery and put it back in. This is a 3.3 volt battery. All motherboards have it to keep track of time and a couple BIOS settings. And it is going to rest on this board. So that covers power. The next thing we're going to go over is the main system components. They will rest in the kind of core part of the board up here. It consists of your CPU, the RAM, and etc. So the first one is the CPU socket. This can be either a land grid array or a pin grid array. And that simply defines how your CPU is going to connect to it. Does the CPU have pins or does the socket itself have pins? In this case, the socket itself has pins. And my processor that I would put in there would be a land grid array. 
And this specific socket is called the LGA1155. That means only processors for the 1155 can go in there. The next thing on our computer is RAM. This is where we slot in RAM. This is where we put stuff to store it. This is where we put Windows at while we're using it. Some motherboards have four, some have two, some even have eight or six. It depends on how many different channels of memory RAM you have. And if you're running a server board with two CPUs, you'll potentially have a lot of physical banks for RAM to be put into, simply due to the high amount of RAM being supported on that system. Here we have a different motherboard here, just to give some examples and comparisons. The last system, main system component we're going to talk about is this right here. This is a PCI Express X16 slot. This means it has 16 lanes of communication to our CPU. This slot is generally used for graphics cards, and these graphics cards would have their own power connector. Some computers will also have extra cards such as sound cards, network cards, capture cards. These would fit into the PCI Express. This is a high speed bus, and it is a lot faster than USB. This is how these components can work so fast and do so much. Now that we've gone over the main system components, let's talk about storage. Storage has always been given its own connector. Before, we would have 40 pin IDE connectors. They were real big and they would have like a ribbon and they would connect to your devices and it would be a large parallel interface. But nowadays we have the SATA interface. It stands for Serial ATA. And this would connect to your hard drive. This would connect to your optical drive and this might also connect to your tape drive as well or any kind of storage related medium and this interface is specifically for storage and there are certain features that it has above USB such as direct media access or basically a way to transfer files without taking up all the processors time it has its own connectors this board has four the other one had six some boards have eight Generally, you're looking at two to support a minimum of a hard drive and an optical drive. Now, the next thing we have is our M.2 drive. This is for NVMe drives. This is for SATA drives. The idea is that this is a super fast interface. So SATA was limited to about 560 Mbps. This one transfers at the PCI Express speeds a lot faster. It has its own dedicated connection to the CPU, it can talk very fast. It is able to store solid state drives only, which just generally makes it faster. It's a very low power consuming bus. So on the bottom of your motherboard, there is a lot of stuff going on. And that is the IO, that the general purpose IO that I wanna go over right now, just to wrap up this video. So down here, we're gonna go over this. This is USB 3.0. This is how your high-speed devices talk to. Any kind of external hard drives nowadays are going to talk through this interface. And this is an internal connector. So this would connect to the front panel of your, of your computer case. And whenever you see a blue USB port on the front of your case, it usually terminates right into this. And there'll be a plug that goes in there. And if we move down the board, we're gonna see two USB 2.0 headers. USB 2.0 has been around forever. It's Relatively cheaper to make. It takes up less size on the board, so we're going to see this around for a while. This is great for your mouses, your printers, your keyboards, any kind of generally low-speed I.O., low speed compared to other high-speed devices such as a external solid-state drive. And as we go down here, we have the front panel audio. This could be the front panel HD audio. And then we also have SPDIF out. Don't see that one used a lot, but it is there and it's generally around the sound card on your motherboard. So whenever you plug your headphones into the front part of your case, this is where it terminates into. This is where, this is how your headphones are talking to your sound card. So my sound card's up, uh, yep, it's right, right here. The front panel audio is right there. So headphones, go to this, go to this. That's how it happens. And the last thing I wanna go over is our front panel connectors. Front panel is your power switch, it is your reset switch, it is your hard drive light, and it is your power light. 
So this allows you to see if your computer is on without having to listen for fans, without having to listen for other things going on. This is a standardized plug by Intel. So little tiny jumpers will go in here. Fun fact, I have a computer back there that I'm able to start with a screwdriver because it doesn't have a case. It's just kind of on the, on the back bench right there. We started with a screwdriver every morning and that's how that thing starts up. What I'm doing is I'm shorting out the power switch pins to turn it on, to simulate me pushing the power button. So that's it for the, wait a minute. We have one last thing to go over. It's the ultimate connector. I can't believe I forgot it. Of all the connectors that we've gone over, this is the most important one. These boards, they don't have it. They were taken out of the wild because they were found to not have this specific connector the specific connector to end all connectors. It is called the, and the real guys don't want you to know this, RGB connector. Red, green, and blue. You get that sweet, sweet decal lighting. Now, but seriously, it is a connector. It is popping up on most modern motherboards, and it's generally characterized by about three or four pins on the same row. It looks very similar to our SPDIF out over here. So if you guys can see that right there, it's just kind of three or four pins in a row. It will generally have a white underlying connector thing and it sticks out a lot. And you'll plug in an RGB strip. You can plug in your AMD prism heatsink fan controller thingy and it, you can control what lights are on that from the motherboard. So that's all for this internal IO connectors. So I want you to know that not everything I went over today is going to be on every single board. So servers and ultra small form factor computers will have their own proprietary connections and same for laptops. So just kind of take it as it goes and I hope this has taught you to not see this as just a barf of plastic and metal, but really as just an organized, this is where stuff goes and this is where I should put stuff. Thank you for watching. Please subscribe. Have a good day. Hi there, my name's Josh and welcome back. Today I wanna to explain another part of your motherboard and this is a very small part of it, but it's a very important part nonetheless. It is this watch battery, this little IC chip, and this little quartz crystal. This is a quartz crystal, it's encapsulated in like an aluminum tube, but if you push electricity through this crystal, it will vibrate. And all of that creates a clock cycle and we're gonna go into that today. It all starts with the need to create clock cycles in computers. Computers are digital, and that requires a big distinction between the high and the low. I think of a sine wave, which is, operates in like a square pattern, and creating a clock cycle to regularly do that up and down is very important. And it needs to be at a regular interval. So in order to create this consistent rhythm, the computer will push electricity through this crystal, and this crystal will vibrate or move at a consistent frequency. And for most crystals out there, it's 32,768 times per second. And you don't have to know that for anything, but just know that it, there's like this standard out there that most computers use. From here, the IC chip that we mentioned earlier, it will, every time that clock happens, every time, you know, every, 32,768 times per second, it will add one to the NVRAM. It's just a little it's a storage memory location, and it's a counter that keeps ticking, keeps ticking up, and voila, you have a digital clock. Other circuits will ask that RAM what is what the value is, and then it will translate it into what we would see as something like 1040 p.m., so that little watch battery in there is 3.3 volts. It is only used when your computer is unplugged from the wall. So right now, this motherboard is not plugged into anything. But this time circuit right here, it's still ticking. And it is still adding and it's still keeping track of the time. It's also keeping track of some more things. Your computer has a BIOS or a UFI. And we'll go over that in other videos. And that that basic input output system program has to store some values. It has to store 
what boot device we're going to go to first. If you're overclocking your CPU, we're going to store some values of how to apply voltage to your CPU. If you are changing the clock speed of your RAM, if you are changing what devices are enabled, all of these settings are stored in that same space where your computer keeps the track of time. And it's important to keep those settings in that temporary place. That way, if you ever apply the wrong settings, you can just take out the battery. Or if you ever need to change those settings, it is an easier process to write to RAM instead of reprogramming a read-only chip. So with this motherboard unplugged from the wall, this battery and the time circuit, it's going to keep ticking. And this battery has enough electricity and it has enough power in it to keep that circuit going for about three years if it's unplugged from the wall. Another cool thing about this is that these batteries are replaceable. They're not soldered onto the board. And you'll find that after about seven years, the battery is just no, no good due to the decomposition and just how the battery was made. So it's nice that we can just pop them out and replace them. So I wanna make a distinction. There is your computer's BIOS, which is the basic input output system. And then the BIOS reads from your CMOS RAM. And that's the, that's the place where your computer keeps ticking and it keeps that counter. It's also where you, your BIOS stores those settings. That's in its own little space. This space is about 256 bytes. About 10 of that is used for the watch and timers and um, you can actually set like alarms and stuff in that as well. And the rest of it is generally used for BIOS settings. So you might notice that when your computer's on, it knows what time it is just automatically without ever having to connect to the internet. And I want to briefly explain what happens when your computer figures out what time it is. And this is very brief, you don't have to understand everything in the process, but it is pretty cool. So your operating system will come in from your storage, it'll get loaded into RAM, and then it'll be ran on the CPU. So here is kind of where you'll have an operating system like Windows or OS X. And then um, say for Win Windows, for example, we'll then ask our chipset, hey, what time is it? And then the chipset will ask the BIOS, hey, what time is it? And then the BIOS will say, oh, let me go check my memory. And then it'll ask this chip, hey, what time is it? And that chip will say, oh, it's 502. And then it'll return to the chipset and then it'll return to the CPU. And then Windows will say, oh, it's 502. That must mean it is March 5th at 5.10 p.m. And the idea is it's translating that through tables that are already built into the operating system. So that's a cool little process I wanted to explain to you. And I will say that once your computer's online, it will usually ask the internet server what time is it. And this is a way to keep everything in sync when you're browsing the web. It can create problems when a website thinks that you're 17 minutes behind and it's kind of double checking stuff and it might deny you access if you don't have the right time. So it's a little thing about time right there. Now I've talked a lot about time and how it's kept track on the computer, but these quartz crystals are actually used for a couple other things on your system. Most notably for me, which I find really cool, is that our chipset will have its own clock. Now this crystal might not be 100 megahertz, but this chipset will do a multiple of that and then you will have 100 megahertz clean, steady, everything that is connected to our chipset can work off of that. So the USB, it might do a fraction of that 100 megahertz to talk to other devices, or it might do a multiple to talk to faster devices. There are things like our SATA, which we'll connect our hard drives to, it might use a fractional part of that 100 megahertz to talk back and forth to our hard drives, to our optical drives, etc. So it is cool that this one crystal will determine the clock speed of a lot of different devices on your computer. And another thing that this crystal is going to determine is going to be your clock speed for your CPU. Now I have a computer, it has a Ryzen 3 3200U. That is a processor that is clocked at 3.2 gigahertz. Now, if my chipset is 100 megahertz, we will have to multiply that by 32 times to get 3.2 gigahertz. So at a speed of 3.2 gigahertz, it can do stuff really fast. And that's what that processor is made for. 
The chipset is not made to run that fast, and it doesn't have to run that fast to get what it needs done. So in summary, we talked about the computer time and how it consists of a quartz crystal, a watch battery, and an IC circuit, all working together to create a digital clock that ticks very regularly and adds up and we can make a time from that. We've also talked about how this creates some storage for our BIOS to store some settings. We've talked about the process about how your, your operating system will get the time from the BIOS. And lastly, we talked about clock multipliers. So my CPU runs at, in the gigahertz range, only because it's a multiple of the, the megahertz range of our chipset. So I hope this video has explained at least one portion of a motherboard and even, even just understanding one small portion at a time will help you look at this whole thing and be like, ah, that makes sense. I can understand, you know, all of these different components. And I thank you all for joining me on this, this adventure as we go and explain every part of this and eventually explain a whole computer system and how it works. So I hope you learned something. Like, subscribe, and thanks for watching. Bye. A chipset is put plainly a series of chips that connect devices within your computer and allow for data to be transmitted to where it needs to go. The name chipset stuck because not too long ago, we had computers that had to have a separate chip for doing each function. If they had to talk to the mouse, it, there had to be a, a chip to talk to the mouse. Same for the keyboard, the audio, the networking. As you can see, this really wasn't a very scalable model. It created boards that were filled with chips. We can take a look at an example of an old IBM PC, one of the first consumer market computers. And these were scattered with chips all over them. And the idea of having to add another component for each thing you wanted to do created a very cramped computer space. And it also halted progress as we were moving towards newer and newer designs. Back in 1986, a company called Chips and Technologies created what would be called the chipset. They started to integrate several functions onto one or more chips. The idea is that they could combine these functions, such as the mouse and keyboard onto one chip, or the audio left and right all on one chip, and networking all on one chip. The idea was you didn't have to create a separate chip for each device on your computer. There's also a lot of other system components that are controlled by the chipset as well. And you don't have to know these, but a couple examples are a memory controller, a cage controller, a system clock, a or a EUFI system, and several other board level features are being controlled by a chipset as well. The idea of a chipset allowed for motherboards to be made cheaper and faster as it didn't require as many components to get the same result. Now this was a trend after 1986 and several other competing companies started developing their own chipsets. This fueled innovation and kept shrinking stuff onto smaller and smaller packages or just less, less and less packages. But there was still the problem of developing a chipset for the processor. Whenever there was a new processor, a suitable chipset had to be designed for one. Take for example the Intel 286. This processor was released and then it took about two years for a consumer motherboard to come out. That's a long time. That also presents a huge adoption challenge to Intel. If companies have spent so much time developing a chipset, then they probably don't want to be making new processors every 18 months. Intel took it into their own hands and developed their own chipset for the Intel 386. They laid out what chips should be used. They created their own, they licensed some. The idea was that the chipset and the processor were made for each other. This was the first example of that. This allowed the Intel 386 to be rolled out in about four months, a very quick turnaround time. AMD follows a similar strategy of developing a chip and then a chipset for it today. A chipset can be thought of as the central person directing all of the data flow within your computer. 
The chipset will support a lot of low-level features, such as direct memory access controllers, high and low-level interrupts, real-time clock, BIOS communications, mouse and keyboard support, talking to all of your peripheral devices, such as an onboard LAN and onboard audio. A chipset is also going to support talking to more commonly known peripherals, such as your PCI Express or your SATA ports or your USB, or if you ever want to put in a SATA M.2 drive, it will most likely have to go through the chipset and then it will be forwarded to the processor for processing. And that chipset is connected to your processor through a very high, high speed bus. And that bus might be at PCI Express times four lane speed, um, very fast, very high bandwidth. That's all you need to know. A trend I want to highlight as far as chipsets goes is how many chips make up a chipset. So an old IBM PC from the 80s might have hundreds of chips just barfed all over the board to control all these features. About 15 years ago, that was all trimmed down to three. Three major chips did most of the, the handling and directing of data within the computer. That consisted of the North Bridge, which was the high-speed communication between your CPU your RAM, and possibly a PCI Express slot. And then we have the South Bridge, which talked to slower devices such as SATA, USB, and occasionally FireWire. I mean, that's just what it was at the time. And then the bottom of the line was the Super I.O. chip. This controlled legacy devices such as those running over a 40-pin IDE, such as those talking to things such as floppy disk, or USB 1.1, think of very slow devices with not a lot of bandwidth to get done. Serial and parallel devices were also an example. When I say serial, I'm talking about the actual 9-pin connector and parallel the long purple connector for old printers. And then about 10 years ago, the features of the Super I.O. chip were dropped or they were integrated onto the South Bridge. This left us with the North Bridge, for high-speed communications, and then the South Bridge for lower-speed communications. And then about five years ago, with the introduction of the Intel Core i-Series fifth generation, the Platform Controller Hub was introduced. The Platform Controller Hub was a combination of the North Bridge and South Bridge, sometimes dropping a few features of the South Bridge, and then they would actually take out some features of the North Bridge, such as PCI Express and memory controller. At this point in computer history, it was all integrated onto the CPU die. So the CPU was having direct access to a PCI Express card or direct access to its own integrated graphics or direct access to its RAM. It no longer needed that North bridge to direct and do all that. The platform controller hub is gonna handle communications to a SATA drive, to a USB drive, to any most other peripheral devices within your computer. If you have onboard LAN and onboard Ethernet, it will most likely go into your platform controller hub. This is abbreviated PCH and in Intel's own manuals. If you look at tablets, notebooks, smartphones, we're starting to see all these features of the North Bridge, the CPU, the South Bridge, all of them have been melded onto one chip. And this process is called System on a Chip actually did a video on it. Check it out, link in the description. I wanted to end this video showing you a diagram of a chipset to help you better visualize it. If we look at a motherboard, it's hard to tell where stuff goes and where it's connected because everything is buried in this multi-layer PCB. So it's hard to see where our PCI Express slot actually goes to. It could go to our processor, it could go to our chipset. There's literally barely any way to tell just by at a glance of this mo motherboard. So let's hop into looking at a graph of a motherboard and maybe this will help simplify the concept to you a little bit more. So here I looked up that motherboard, the A320 chipset block diagram. Do that for your chipset and you'll find some similar looking graphs. I couldn't find the A320 because it's honestly just a cheap chipset. It's the lowest of the AM4 platform, but we can find some stuff on the B350. Now this will tell you the PCI from APU, 
that can also be thought of as your processor. So this is the chipset. It's talking to SATA, 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 PCI Express, USB, USB. Very, very nice here. And then there was also another more kind of detailed one. So here we have the X570 platform from AMD. We're gonna pull this open. Um, there we go. And here we have the Ryzen APU, Advanced Processing Unit. It's just a marketing term. This is the processor right here. And it connects to our USB, some PCI Express, our NVMe drive, and our it talks directly to our RAM. And then there is a connection to the chipset. This is the chipset right here. USB, PCI Express, and some SATA. So that's a very simplified version of what's going on. And here's another one for an Intel one. There's no difference as far as what a chipset does when it comes to Intel. Some, fe some more features might be on the processor, but the idea is that this chipset is going to handle communications to a lot of slower speed devices within the computer. And here we actually have the HD audio right there and we see it goes directly into the chipset. So that was some super simplified diagrams. I would ask that you guys look up your chipset, figure out what's going on. Um, my laptop here has an A300 series chipset. Back there we have a, um, a very old Intel, I think it's 87 chipset. Um, find out what chipset you're using, what it does, and you can learn a lot more about your computer that way. My name's Josh, thanks for joining me as we learned a little bit about chipsets. Drop a like, drop a subscribe, have a good day, and goodbye. Hi there, my name is Josh, and thanks for joining me today. Today I wanna to highlight a concept called System on a Chip, or SOC. And to really understand this, you have to go back to before SOC. My journey starts with just tearing apart PCs, looking at the motherboard, and seeing what I can figure out. Now when you do this enough, you start to notice some patterns. There's the CPU, there's the uh, smaller CPU, and then there's the unshielded, just kind of plain PC CPU. I know that sounds really vague and kind of not explained well, but like there was these tiers of this was the cool chip, this is the chip that kind of talk to everything. It might have handled graphics, talking to your hard drives and stuff. It did all that. And then the chip below that handled all of your legacy devices, like talking to your ISA slots or talking to your floppy disk or talking to other devices that were very slow and didn't need to be communicated to as fast as other devices such as graphics and network cards at the time. So I was able to recognize this pattern back in my Windows 95 computer I was able to recognize this pattern in my 2010 gateway computer. I forget what time it was, doesn't matter. And then I also the PCs I build today, they have that same thing of CPU and then that other chip that talks to stuff. Now there's not a third chip anymore and we'll get into that. So it's been a long time tradition for PC makers to have CPU. We have the North Bridge as Intel would call it in the North Bridge would talk to all of your high-speed I.O. devices, such as graphics and network and maybe USB, USB 3.0, the faster stuff that has to talk to your computer at speeds of maybe over 200 megabits per second. So after that, there was the slower, the, the South Bridge. The South Bridge talked to devices such as floppy disk and hard drives running over the PADA or IDE interface. It would talk to devices like your ISA cards. And ISA cards were very slow, very legacy. They didn't run fast and they couldn't transfer speeds very fast. They did basic device functions such as talking to stuff. So the Southbridge would also handle device functions like IO, serial communications, which was a, bit, a relatively slow bus that you would use to control another device. So you didn't need to send data fast to it. That's just how it was for over 20 years, actually. CPU, Northbridge, Southbridge, and that's how it was. Stuff was just laid out like that. How did I ever learn about SOCs? Well, it all started back in 2005. Someone made the Xbox 360. Jump forward to 2010 when I actually cared about the Xbox 360. I learned that the graphics card 
or the graphics processing unit was actually built onto the north bridge as we would see it. And this graphics processing unit would also have control of the RAM. And the CPU was like kind of in its own area up here, like way out of frame. And like, when I looked at this, I had to do a double take. I thought like, I thought Wikipedia didn't load the page right. It was weird. It was just a proprietary PC running Microsoft software playing these games. The games that would run pretty much identically on a normal PC. When I looked at this, it changed how I thought. I was, I was physically looking at the motherboard, and I'll show you a picture here. I looked at the motherboard and I was like, whoa, that's crazy. There's a CPU, there's the GPU, and then there's like this crummy little south bridge and I was like wait a minute where how do they handle the USB devices how do they handle the graphics you know talking to the graphics card what what is orchestrating all of this and then I did some more research and found out that the graphics card in the north bridge ie the device that is handling all the high speed communications like USB and networking were built onto the same chip and this chip was surrounded by the RAM, and it was clear that the RAM wasn't directly connected to the CPU. You could see the traces that went into this one. Now, I didn't think we could integrate components like that. It just seems like it was against the rules. And then 2009 happened. Intel published their specifications and kind of a, everything and released a bunch of products. And these products were revolutionary because they combined the features of the North Bridge and the South Bridge into one chip and this chip became called the Platform Controller Hub. So the Platform Controller Hub talked to all the devices except maybe for RAM. RAM was just kind of RAM and RAM and the GPU like that's all it's really high speed ecosystem of bits flying here and there and then you have this Platform Controller Hub that talks to your USB, talks to your networking, talks to your audio, talks to your SATA drives, talks to whatever else is in your PC, honestly. This platform controller hub was an integration of these two chips. And I thought, boom, how did they do that? And if I were to take a guess, it would be eliminating some legacy stuff and then also combining more stuff onto the CPU die package. And we'll get to that later. So after my time with the Xbox 360, this was years later, we were kind of still in this CPU platform controller hub and that's just what happened. I got my hands on a Raspberry Pi 3. So I gotta be honest, it's not really a PC. It has an ARM processor, has a lot of integrated functions. I don't even think it would reach the minimum specifications for like installing Windows or if you could, it wouldn't be very pretty. This was a very slow general purpose computer but when I first got it, I did what any person did. They installed Ubuntu, got it working, got a display output, got a mouse and keyboard, and I pulled up Firefox and opened YouTube and I subscribed to this channel and it worked. And like, what? How did this work? This is like a tiny little box. So I did what any person would do. I tore it apart and looked at it very closely. There is only two chips on this board. There is a big Broadcom chip, and then there's also another chip that is clearly a USB controller. And you can tell by the traces and also controls the LAN. Now just one chip has that memory controller, has the RAM, has some storage, a little bit, not a whole lot. And then it has the CPU, it has multiple different cores clocked at a what 1.2 gigahertz at the time. And all of this happens on this tiny, 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 tiny little thing. How? How did they integrate so much function onto this? Well, they just did. <laughs> I don't have an answer for that. But this is getting closer to our concept of system on a chip. So now we have most of the features of the system built onto this one chip. And then across from that is like a supporting chip to talk to our USB, to talk to our ethernet. Now, if we go forward today, we have what's called the system on a chip. The system on a chip is what runs this. This is my smartphone. And if you open up my smartphone, you're probably only gonna find one important chip. Just like that Raspberry Pi, most of those features are built onto one chip. These components always include a CPU, memory, input output, and storage to save stuff for later. So these are kind of the basic parts of a computer that will always be, and just, you know, kind of theory-wise, 
system on a chip is everything all in one CPU package. And that is where I believe the future we're going towards as I look at boards and I see them with less and less chips. And I believe that we will move towards a more system on a chip design with all computers that are coming. And while a Xeon processor may always have to be separated simply because of its high heat output, I believe that will turn into be the exception rather than the rule. So I hope this video has talked to you about system on a chip and I hope that you can formulate the concept that it is an integration of all these different packages onto one thing that does everything, that handles all the input output, that does all the processing, that holds all the memory though, that talks to all your storage, all in one chip. So I thank you for watching and hope you learned something. Bye. Peace. Subscribe if you want. Hi there, my name is Josh and thanks for joining me today. Today I want to talk about computer buses. So a bus is something that you pay for a ticket, you get on and it takes you somewhere else. Well, so one of the buses is. That's not the bus we're going to go over today. We're going to go over the specific communication protocols that exist between two or more different components. And this could be within your system or outside of your system. This could also apply to software as well, but we're going to look at the hardware implementations of this. A bus is, put simply, the connection between two devices. And it usually takes place of a copper wire holding a plus and a negative, and then data is put through that signal. But a bus allows a lot of things to happen within a computer system. Now there are three different types of buses I'm going to go over today. They are the system bus, really fast, expansion bus, used for expanding the computer system's capabilities, and then there's peripheral bus for sending data out and accepting data from the outside. But before we get into that, let's talk about the history of a bus. You see, back in the 1970s, computer components were not as small. In fact, they were huge. And a cabinet might be dedicated solely to processing, and then, then another cabinet might be dedicated to hard drive, and then another one would be dedicated to short-term memory, and maybe some other I.O. operations. The idea is that these were three separate huge components and they needed to be connected in an efficient manner. And they were connected with what was called a bus bar. It was a series of parallel wires all running and everything's all attached together. And it ran on a bar and it was the back plane of these components that connected everything. This allowed the CPU to fetch something from memory, process it, and save it to the hard drive. So back then the bus bar connected three separate cabinets of components and nowadays a bus is much smaller. It connects components within a single board and sometimes with even within a single chip. Which is like, whoa, that's cool. <laughs> so let's talk about system buses. These are the system buses that connect the CPU to your RAM, your CPU to your platform controller hub, also known as a chip chipset. And then the system buses also connect components within the computer. And that could be the CPU to the memory controller. It could be the CPU to the um, interrupt request. Um, some very things we don't really mess with. But a system bus would be the things that are connecting within a system to make it work. The bus within your system is going to be primarily responsible for about three different things. And it's all related to the CPU. So the CPU has to be fed code, it has to find address of memory, and it has to, you know, send out requests for memory, and then it has to accept data. So the control of addition, minus, subtraction, division, multiplication, etc., all the different math stuff your CPU does, the data it, up, it manipulates with that code, and then where to put the data or where to fetch the data from. Those are three different things that are very core to any CPU, and that is one of the main purposes of a system bus. So one example of a system bus is called the front side bus. This is the connection between your CPU and the chipset. And for Intel, this might be called the quick path interconnect or ultra quick path interconnect. They've had several different names throughout the years. For AMD, it has been historically hypertransport, 
But nowadays we are starting to see AMD Infinity fabric. And then we are also connecting our AMD chips to the chipset with something called PCI Express, which we'll get into with our expansion buses. These are just some examples within your system. They can tell you a lot about your system, about how data moves within your system and where it goes, how it's moved, how fast it's moved, how much is moved, and really great topics to look into. But for now, all you need to know is that these are system buses, very specific to the motherboard or the chipset or the CPU that you're working with. Generally, the components involved do not change, i.e. the chipset does not change or the processor doesn't change or the bus within the processor doesn't change. It's the idea that these are baked onto the board, they're gonna allow stuff to move where it needs to go, and um, in the case of you know your memory controller, all these paths are burned into the PCB and they connect the processor to the RAM. The next thing I wanna go over is an expansion bus. The expansion bus is anything that is going to expand the capabilities of your motherboard or your computer system and that could be adding a hard drive. Maybe you're adding a hard drive over the SATA bus. Maybe you're adding a graphics card and you put it in the PCI Express bus. Or maybe you're adding a solid state drive and you're adding it to the M.2 bus. These are all buses within your system that are designed to expand the capabilities of what it can do. Now these have historically been used to add uh, sound cards, network cards, and graphics cards. These were things that didn't necessarily ship with every computer back in the 1980s or 90s, but these expansion buses allowed that to just be popped in and it works. And we still have them today for adding high-speed network cards, for adding graphics cards, sometimes even two or more graphics cards, and then we also have them around for adding wireless capabilities. There is a note I wanna make here on the expansion bus, and it's that storage has always been given its own bus. It started back when we had the 40 pin IDE cables. They're really slow. They operated in parallel, which by the way is sending multiple bits at a time. And then we moved to the SATA, which is serial ATA, which is sending one bit at a time, but sending it a lot faster. Serial is what we use in a lot of our systems now as a communication method. It's a lot easier to send one bit at a time then to send possibly 19 bits at a time. That way everything, you know that everything gets there in order. You can increase the transmission speed as you go. So as far as storage, we've gone from the 40 pin IDE, we've gone to SATA, now we're on to M.2. It is a really fast port and it allows for PCI Express lane speeds, which leads us to our next expansion bus. PCI Express. It's been around forever. It is the successor of the PCI bus and it is the successor of the ISA bus. So those are the two major expansion buses within your system. Probably more than you want to know. Anyways, let's go on to peripheral buses. So the last type of bus within your computer is called the peripheral buses. This will include our well-known, known and favorite, the USB. This is the universal serial bus. This is a standard form of communication that we tend to use for literally everything nowadays. There's USB mouse, there's USB keyboard, there's USB webcams, there's USB um, flash drives, there's USB microphones, there's USB, and it goes on. USB is a great example of a peripheral bus. Other examples of a peripheral bus are any displays that you connect. This can include HDMI, VGA, Display port. All of these are ways in which video is outputted from your system. Another peripheral bus is gigabit ethernet. Maybe you're sending out audio. And maybe you're just old school and use a serial port or a parallel port to connect your old printer. I wanted to make this video to explain just what a bus is. And maybe in some later videos we'll go over and really tear apart some specifications such as USB or PCI Express, or you know, AMD's Infinity Fabric is a really hot one right now. Um, maybe in future videos we can go over that and try to understand those more. But in order to better understand any of them, you have to understand what a bus is and what kind of bus it is within the system. Is it a part of the core system, high-speed communication system bus? Is it a part of the expansion bus designed to expand the capabilities of the system? 
or is that a peripheral bus for accepting or receiving data outside of the system? I hope this has taught you about buses. Thank you for your time. Please like, subscribe. Thanks for watching. Bye. Hello, my name is Josh and thanks for joining me today. Today I want to talk to you guys about the BIOS in your system. The BIOS stands for the Basic Input Output System. It is a chip on your motherboard, but it's also more than a chip. It's a program that connects everything and we're going to learn about it today. So right here, we actually have an example of a BIOS. It is this chip right here. And that is the BIOS that is the basic input output system for this Asus H97 Plus motherboard. So let's break it down. Basic, meaning the basic low level, possibly assembly language code that is going to control all of the devices on your motherboard. This could be directly talking to the sound chip or directly talking to any integrated graphics and so forth. This is some very machine level code that a program like Google Chrome may not understand, but it's eventually translated by the BIOS to the actual chip to create the lovely music or sound that you're hearing right now. Next part is input and output. This is translating the machine code of going in or out of your computer. So whenever you move your mouse up or press the A key, you're sending a string of bits to your CPU. Well, the CPU doesn't really know what to do with the letter A or the up on the mouse, unless it has some in between telling it all. Oh, the mouse device moved up, so I'm gonna tell that to the operating system. So this is the input output part of the BIOS. And it's a system because it is multiple parts. So I showed you a chip earlier, and on that chip is a program that connects other parts to it. So your sound card might have some read-only memory code that is linked to the BIOS and acts as a system. Now all of these devices are acting as one thing to accept input and output of, out of the system. So let's get into this a little bit more. So in the early days of computers, I'm talking the 80s and 90s, the BIOS would handle all input output of the system. This is great, but you also gotta consider back then there was really only like three or four different devices floating around and the stuff was pretty standardized. Nowadays, we have all kinds of different devices that do all sorts of different things. And the BIOS, it's not feasible to make one BIOS for everything. So what we do is create drivers. A driver is something that works at the operating system level. The BIOS is the standard way that Windows or Mac will talk to your components. Take for example, these two sound chips and these two network cards. These were made by different companies, but they essentially do the same thing. They output audio and they download and upload stuff from the internet. That's great and all, but Windows doesn't necessarily know how to talk to your sound chip. It doesn't know how to talk to your sound chip. It doesn't know how to talk to your network card. All Windows knows is how to talk to your BIOS. So what the BIOS does, it will accept standard communication from your operating system, such as upload this packet to this IP, and then it will translate that into machine level code that it can then send to the device. In this instance, it is the network card. So on my motherboard, I said there was a BIOS chip. On this one, we can actually remove it. And I'm gonna do that for you guys. So here's the chip, it's really tiny. And this is what's called a read-only memory chip. And it is possible to write to it, but the process is very tedious and it can only be done a certain number of times. So why would I ever want to write to the BIOS? Well, usually one of two reasons. One, it's broken. Stuff happens and maybe something on it is corrupted and we need to flash the BIOS which means to overwrite the data and put in a new program. Another reason is to update the BIOS. Take for example, you have a A320 motherboard and it supports second gen processors and you wanna go up to the third gen processors. You can actually do that with a BIOS update. And I'm talking about the AMD Ryzen 2 and then Ryzen 2 Plus. Um, with a BIOS update, you can use the same motherboard for a newer generation chip. 
So your BIOS is able to store some important settings about your computer. The BIOS has its own little piece of RAM. It's called NVRAM and it is powered by a watch battery. It's usually a C2032 watch battery and I'll have one right here to show as an example on this board. It's right here. It is, uh, I think, 3 volts or 1.5. I don't know. It doesn't matter. Just simple watch battery and this will keep the system time as well as the BIOS settings. The BIOS has some settings that you can change and this includes, but it's not limited to, boot order, fan speeds, overclocking profiles, XMP settings, and RGB enabling. No, but seriously, the BIOS holds a lot of settings and there's a lot of configuration you can do. This is useful for troubleshooting or setting up just, maybe you're changing some drives in the PC and you wanna to boot to a different device. So the BIOS will store these settings and if you ever put in the wrong settings or are unable to boot with the settings that you've put in, you can actually remove the watch battery and it will clear out the settings. This will put the BIOS back to its default profile and you can reconfigure it as you will. This is often done with overclocking or perhaps you just set a wrong fan speed and you want to change it without going through all the settings. Also very useful if you have a password on your BIOS. The BIOS settings can be password protected and you are able to reset this password by removing the watch battery. The BIOS password is great for if you're in a secure environment and you need to maybe disable some devices such as USB. And just as an extra, the battery in your system is good for three years without power. And while the system is on, it will use the system power. But when you turn your computer off and unplug it, it will actually switch to the battery power. For this little circuit that keeps track of time, memory, and any other settings in your BIOS. When you first turn on your computer, the BIOS is the one that administers what's called a post test. Oh, that's kind of redundant because it actually means power on self test. And the power on self test checks all the devices that are linked to the BIOS. And if any ROMs are attached to the BIOS, meaning read only memory programs that are attached to the BIOS, it will check those as well. Basically, it's gonna check every device that's connected to the motherboard. And take for example, this little wireless receiver, if it was short circuiting, it, it might cause the BIOS to fail its post. If a device is short circuiting within the motherboard, such as your RAM is put in wrong, um, the BIOS will fail its post and then the system will not start up. You don't wanna start up a system with a failing device. That's just no good. So the power on self test is a very important thing for every computer to pass and it shows that all the devices connected are working or at least are able to get by. The BIOS is able to throw some other errors such as the keyboard malfunctioning or maybe the hard disk is not found or um, it tried to read the hard disk and it just wasn't working. So after your computer finishes its post and everything passes and everything works, it will start looking for what's called a boot sector. If you have a boot manager installed, which is probably what you have if you have an operating system installed, the boot manager starts with a specific line of code. And if when the BIOS is searching for it, it finds it, it will then load a bunch of stuff to RAM, and then the CPU will start executing the program known as your operating system. This is an important part of your BIOS in booting to devices and getting anything done, really. If you couldn't boot anything, well, your computer would basically be a brick. So here we have a nice picture to really explain all the concepts we've gone over today. Up here, you have your applications. If you're watching this in Google, in Google Chrome, then right here is Chrome. Chrome has a standard way to talk to your operating system through what's called an API, Application Programming Interface. This is a standard way that Chrome, Firefox, Adobe Premiere, and whatever else you have installed on your program on your operating system can talk to the operating system. Now Windows has a standard way to talk to the BIOS. And that might be through just BIOS or the UEFI interface. Um, the idea is that Windows and your BIOS have a standard way to talk to each other. And these are connected through a standard way. 
If you have a non-standard device, this might be like a Logitech C920 that doesn't exactly have its own firmware and it doesn't have its own BIOS or ROM chip to really look at. Windows will, it won't be able to use it until the device drivers are loaded. Device drivers are a common way that Windows can talk to them and then the device drivers will which is a program that drives the so the hardware, it will then convert that to the hardware and send C920 to maybe autofocus or receive data from it. You gotta think that for all levels of this, communication goes both ways. And then here we have the BIOS, which is going to control the hardware. The BIOS, this is not a standard communication. The BIOS had to be made because we can't make a new operating system for every new piece of hardware. That's just not practical. And if we're going to assemble a bunch of pieces of hardware, such as a CPU, RAM, memory, address controller, interrupt controller, um, PCH, um, all other related things, we have to create a standard way that the operating system can talk to it all. That's what the BIOS is. It fits in here. If your device has firmware, so I know a lot of higher end graphics cards have their own ROM that can be read to. This makes them usable by default and we can just put a generic display on there. The ROM is linked to the BIOS and this acts as a unified system. That way the operating system can talk to, our, to the firmware of our graphics card which is right now a generic display driver. Once I install the actual device drivers for the graphics card, Windows has a much better communication to it. But just know that devices might include their own firmware, their own ROM to link to the BIOS for Windows to talk to them until the appropriate device drivers are installed. Application, operating system, firmware, BIOS, and then the hardware. Everything kind of links down into the hardware. The last thing I want to talk to you guys about is the UEFI. This is called the Unified Extensible Firmware Interface. The UEFI system is an improvement to the BIOS. It still serves all of the same basic functions as the BIOS. However, it has corrected some errors and some exploits that have appeared over the years, such as rootkits, which is maybe as some malicious code that hides in the boot sector portion of the computer. The UEFI also supports drives of much higher capacity. Think drives that are bigger than two terabytes. The UEFI provides just nice plug and play support for those drives without having to load some drivers. The UEFI also supports secure boot, which will check all the drivers for the devices that you're using and make sure that they're working, they're signed, and that there's no exploits found on the devices that are connected to your computer. An example could be I might try to install some bad code to read everything that you type in your keyboard. And to do that, I might flash the keyboard ROM and put in some bad code. That way I can store it all for myself and look at it later. Well, Secure Boot alleviates that problem of, you know, malicious code hiding where we might never see it. And your antivirus would never see it as well. Your antivirus is trained to look at your storage device, not really at your BIOS. UEFI is a great improvement and is something that you'll see. And not to mention, anytime you boot into the UEFI, you're going to find a nice interface. BIOS used to look really gross. It was like this horrible, blindingly blue light and there was like some yellow involved. Now we have the UEFI interface and I got to say, I love it. I'm a fan. Thank you guys for watching. I hope this video has taught you about a BIOS and what it does and the core functions that it performs within your computer. If you like this video, please like and subscribe. Well, hey, fancy meeting you here. So I've been talking about motherboards for this series for a while, and I think it's just appropriate that we just build with the motherboard, we build a computer system. So that's what this video is gonna be about. Yeah, don't worry, motherboard's right here. So, after opening our box and sifting through it, this is what happened for most any motherboards. We have the motherboard, no surprise there. We have this, the rear I.O. guard, 
is also used by trained assassins all over the world because it's the sharpest object known to man. And the last one is SATA cables, if you're still into using optical drives, which we are today. So the next part of this is a little bit of pre-assembly before we actually put it in a case. Next, you want to look through your ramp, find some that... Once you've weeded out the weak, take the strong and put it in the motherboard. So come on with me, cameraman. We can't do this all day. So we have our ramp, and we have a fancy little notch. Pull out one of these. And you're gonna look for DDRA1. That says channel one, slot one. That's where your first RAM card will go. And I only have one today, so that's okay. And then you just get in there and then you get that nice, ah, so satisfying. Before you really begin your technological adventure, you need to pick your starter hard drive. This will help you in all of your journeys. So you have the leaf type, you have the water type, and you have the fire type. But let's be honest, all of this is garbage. Nowadays, we use solid state drives, and it's beautiful. Solid state drives. Line up the stuff, and give it a nice screw in. There we go. No cables, no power, just go. So, any very good motherboard needs a good processor, and today we've found out the only, the very best of the Ryzen series. It is a Ryzen 3. 3200G. Literally no other processor has any handle on this thing right here. As far as being the cheapest. So here we are, Ryzen 3 3200G. Love this guy. This one has a very smooth finish. So we're gonna come down here and we're gonna, oh geez. And we're gonna line up our golden triangles in the corners, get it in there, and push down. Have this big, Thickalicious heat sink. Let's get that on there. So, for the bigger heat sinks, they would actually use these clamps. But since we're at the cheapest of the barrel, we're not going to use these. These are for fancy people. So this is that gross thermal paste. You know it's thermal paste if you get it on your fingers and you're like, <laughs> let's line it up here. Get everything lined up. Do not scratch the board. That's a big no-no. You can't unscratch the board. Believe me, I've tried. Doesn't work. So there I was on Amazon and I found the cheapest metal box we could put our computer in. And here it is, 36 bucks, US dollars, I love it. And uh, we're gonna put our motherboard in there today. Next, you wanna open your, your case, two screws off here and then give it a nice subtle karate chop, like Hyah! And then you can Hyah! Now you're gonna take your motherboard and just put it in there, just put it in the box. <sighs> Something's not right. So take the sharpest tool known to man and you're gonna put it in the motherboard. Case, thing, make sure you get it popped in there. Do not cut yourself, this is a very dangerous part. I cannot stress enough. Once you've done that, it's done off to putting in the motherboard. So take your motherboard, we're gonna go in here. This case has headers pre-installed, but I did find that one of these was off. So this one should be in this. And the reason I figured that out was I gently put everything in here, kind of brought it up to that rear IO shield, and I discovered that this one is just hanging over, over here, and then there's nothing really right here to connect it. So we're gonna adjust that and then screw this thing in. Always be very careful moving it out. Um, there's lots of sensitive contacts on the bottom of this board. Don't want stuff touching. So now we're gonna put the motherboard in the case. We're gonna gently put everything down. We're gonna line up that rear I.O. We don't want anything sticking. We wanna be able to use all of our ports. Just double check in there to make sure we can get everything. So now, we're screwing the motherboard into the case. We don't want it to get away. We don't want to, in the middle of the night, have this thing run off. It's very bad, it's hard to track these. And local law enforcement may look at you funny when you tell them that it ran away. So now we just have a few things to plug in, but don't get overwhelmed. As long as you get the power and the power button, that's all you need to get along. So now we're on to the most stressful part of the build, where we put this in, and we hope we don't break the PCB in half. This one went in fine. Others, you might not be so lucky. Hmm. 
So now we're going to plug in the CPU power. This is to feed our little 3200G. The 65 watts it needs. And click. There we go. That's not going anywhere. We'll zip tie these two together. So, contrary to popular belief, some people still use these. I don't know why, but this computer has a DVD drive. And we're going to install the SATA cable and the power cable for it and connect it to our motherboard. Let's get to it. This power supply was really weird and it had the four pin Molex connector at the very end. So I had to like zip tie it and Frankenstein it together to make this look like it's at the end. This is a four pin SATA connector. It's supposed to be five pin, but the, uh, oh God, is five pin. That's weird. I didn't know they still did that. Anyways, let's plug it in. So there we go. We're at the bottom of our SATA drive and that's power in. So, oh. Got a key in backwards and just just yeet it in there until it works. So the reason that I say, oh God, I don't know why the people do that anymore is because the four pin, I mean the fifth pin is a 3.3 volt and it's actually optional for a lot of the devices. And I could run this off a four pin, uh, 12 volt, five volt, and it would still work. Mm -hmm. So now we have the last three connectors. It's our USB 3.0, and this has a big thing. We're gonna show you that in a second here. Click, we're in. The next one up here is the HD front audio. This is for the microphone and headphone port in the front of the case. So we're just gonna come up here at the very end of the board. I know it's this one because if you look at that, that's an alien with his hands up, and that is a Realtek sound card. Here we go. Got that nice and in there. And then the last part is, admittingly not the funnest, but is super essential, is the front panel connectors. This is for a reset, a hard drive light, power switch. So pro tip here, for any of your switches, it doesn't matter how they're keyed. They could go in frontwards, backwards, doesn't matter. But if you have a LED, which is a light emitting diode, just know that electricity can only go one way. And you can find that your motherboard marks where the, where the plus is, and also these little connectors will mark where the plus and where the minus is. It's really tiny, but it's definitely there. So the purpose of this video was to get you more comfortable with the motherboard, just to show you uh, kind of a crash course on how you're gonna put this in there and put everything together. I hope we got that done. And next part is turn it on, see if it works. You don't have to install Windows or anything. If you turn it on, it will do the power on self test and you'll see if it works or not. Next part is install Windows, get a flash drive, go to download Windows 10 or something, um, or Mac if you're into that, or Linux, it doesn't really matter. And then the last part is install your drivers, install the most up to date drivers from the website. So here, this is a AS Rock board. I would go to AS Rock's website and download their stuff. After you do all this, you won't have to mess with the motherboard for probably a long time until you have to do the regular maintenance of dusting it out and stuff. So I hope this helped and have a good day. Bye. Wait, you weren't recording? Hard drive. No. Ooh. So here we go. Here we go. Here we go. Here we go. <laughs> Hi there, my name is Josh, and let's go over some motherboard concepts and apply them to laptops. Let's get into it. So the first concept I talked about was form factors and how do you apply that to a laptop? And the first thing that we got to consider is how big this laptop is. And if we're going to measure that, it's going to be diagonally. So if you ever hear something like a 17 inch screen or a 13 inch screen, you'll find that it's measured diagonally. I know that this one's about 15.6 inches. And if we were to measure the screen open, it would be that. So we're gonna call this a 15.6 inch laptop. Sometimes they come in bigger sizes like 17. Sometimes they're smaller like 14 and 13. I've even seen those, but Anything smaller than that is kind of like a, a, a tablet form factor. This isn't like, the, there's no such thing as a mobile ATX platform. And I wish there was, but um, 
This motherboard is built specifically by Acer for Acer laptops of this specific size. And it works and we're able to get really compact designs and there's a lot of benefits, but five years from now, if this motherboard were to die, which it probably will, um, I'm not gonna be able to replace it with anything newer. So it's kind of generation locked here. And it's different than the computer in a box where I can just pull the motherboard out and put in some new components and be ready to go. So that's, um, you know, the motherboard is here. And then all the other stuff that, that connects to it is, is built for this motherboard. So I'm not gonna find like a newer generation USB over here or, um, you know, if, if this only supports SATA, then I'm not gonna find a NVMe connector for that. So form factor is kind of a moot point when it comes to laptops. Next thing is motherboard IO internals. That was a huge thing um, when we looked at our, our micro ATX board. And here, there's a lot of standardized ones that you'll see across any laptop, um, nearly any laptop that you run across. So a lot of the ones nowadays, they have this battery built in and it has its own connector. If you're ever gonna work on a laptop, you, mu you have to take out the battery first. So the battery is a huge one before you, uh, before you touch anything else, take that out, take that out. And we're not doing anything today. We're just pointing at stuff. So we're gonna leave that in. You'll find the RAM modules. Um, so if you have a, if you have just a new regular laptop, these will still have um, small mobile dim, dims that you can take out and put back in. On some high-end MacBooks and uh, Ultrabooks, you'll find that the RAM is actually built onto the motherboard, so it'll be soldered in there and you can't take it out, which can be a good thing or a bad thing. It depends on how you look at it. So that's, so that's something you can take out and put back in. And then there's the Wi-Fi card. This one's a very tiny one here, kind of hard to see, but um, this is going to handle all the Bluetooth, is going to handle any kind of wireless connections. I know that this one does 2G and 5G connections. Uh, so like two gigahertz, five gigahertz, Wi-Fi signals. So that's that's where this goes. These antennas generally go to the um, to the screen, as that that's uh, a great position for them to be in to pick up signals. And then some other I/O internals that are standard is uh, under here. We'll find a keyboard connector that is a, a very large pin because there's a lot of different signals that are sent to and from the keyboard. This one's lucky to have a keyboard backlight and I'm very thankful. I like that. Um, so SATA connects here. This is actually a SATA connector, but it's not the SATA connector that we would see in the desktops. Um, but electrically speaking, this is SATA. This is a SATA hard drive over here and um, that's where we would that's where the SATA connection comes into the board. Over here, this is a USB and um, actually it's just USB. Some, some of them have like a power light. Um, so we see the USB connector here. And then we also see like a, a, a cord going to our right speaker. So you'll see a lot of tricks where like the audio is kind of baked into the board and then it travels across this loop. And then over here, um, Laptops kind of have some awkward designs sometimes, but it always works. Um, so the speakers is another thing. They go in and if you have integrated speakers, just a plus and the minus that go into the board. Fan, so this computer has a, a fan on here and then the fan connectors right here. Electrically speaking, this is a, just like your fan connector in a desktop. This one might be, you know, five volts, uh, but it's still gonna operate just like a fan. It has that, that sensor and it has uh, the voltage plus minus in there. And it, and it comes out. Over here is a LCD connector. So I have a 1080p display on the underneath of this and that's where it connects to our board. So this is gonna go into our processor with integrated graphics. Now if I had a discrete graphics card on this, which as you can see, I do not, it just, it's kind of a, a, it's left blank there. And that's more cost effective for them to just leave it blank rather than design a new board without that. So this is where a discrete graphics card would go. This is where the power modules for that graphics card would go. And then it would connect into the processor with a PCI Express connection that is just baked into the board. 
Uh, there's no discrete components with this. And we don't see discrete graphics cards on laptops. It's actually all integrated, but you know, it can be a separate chip and that's where you'll see that awesome performance. So over here we have the power jack and that comes in. Um, this just has a plus and a minus. So this brings in, it's usually like 19 volts. And at that point it is split up through some power circuitry. I think it's on the bottom side of this board, which will then distribute it to your RAM, your CPU and, and the rest of the board. And it will also go into the battery and charge it. So this, this is a removable connector. It's nice that it's removable because some people would like to uh, stick things in there and it breaks and uh, you can replace them. It's very nice. This one's a very short cord. Some of them are longer. All motherboards seem to have some special connectors for data and storage. Uh, this one has some SATA over here that I talked about briefly, how it connects to the board. I was lucky to have a SATA hard drive and it had an expansion bay. This was a pleasant surprise when I first opened this up and I was like, oh, let me put in an old hard drive and this one's from like 2013. And if you're watching this video, chances are it's actually stored on here. And then over here, we have a the actual boot drive. This is done over the M.2, very fast interface. This one is, um, for some reason, they only just used a portion of it and rightly so, it's about 128 gigs. The video is not gonna be on here because these video files are like three gigabytes. So they're not gonna end up on this. They would fill it up very quickly. So this right here is for a real-time clock battery. And this is a normal three volt battery. Oh, well, let me just pry it up here. It's usually, they, I, don't, I don't get these little things. Some motherboards have that same connector that a a desktop motherboard to have. Some of them have this weird little wire. So this is a three volt battery, 220 milliamps, and that is going to keep the real time clock circuits ticking and any BIOS settings that I have in there. And there might be, there might actually be some crystals on the underside of this to create a system clock that we can all, you know, that it can work with there. This is replaceable. You can buy these online for five bucks. So a laptop has buses just like a desktop. So our, our CPU has a lot of, uh, it actually has some internal buses here. So there's integrated graphics and then there is the processor and then there's like the, what's called the system on a chip. And all of those connect through some very high speed interconnects, might be PCI Express or Infinity Fabric. Um, just know that a lot of system buses happen in here. And then a system bus connects the RAM as well. So that concept, while it does look different, it still acts the same. This is still just a regular connection to our RAM. And then there is some expansion buses, such as adding a hard drive or adding a solid state drive. But other than that, we're not gonna see like the PCI Express of adding a discrete graphics card or a discrete network card. There's just no room on the mobile package to do that. And I think uh, if we were to add in like a PCI Express slot, it would make things a lot bigger. It would complicate power delivery and just not something we, we, we look into anymore. It was done at one point, but very briefly. And there is of course some peripheral buses that we're all used to. So we have network, uh, video, and then there's some USB. There's my audio and there's another USB over here. And then Bluetooth is actually providing quite a bit of peripheral buses on this. I know I run my speakers through it, my Xbox controller, my Wii remotes, um, if I'm playing some old games, it, it all goes through this, it's very nice. Um, so that, that is still a bus, even though it's not a physical electrical connection. Um, being able to connect devices to your, to your system is very important. I think, I think Bluetooth is a godsend because it's helped you know, mitigate having to add more buses here and more buses here. Um, we can do a lot of stuff wirelessly nowadays. So in summary, we have you know, the system buses, um, as far as expansion buses, maybe some hard drives and, and solid state, but nothing real huge. And then we have the, the regular peripheral buses on the outside. And the next thing is BIOS. And there is a discrete chip for BIOS. I believe it's on the, on the underside of this. There is still a discrete BIOS chip for this, and it's going to connect to the SOC. The SOC is, as I said before, is just a combination of processor, graphics, chipset. It's all on one very tiny, very compact package. 
And believe it or not, this processor is actually only rated for a, a thermal power of about 15 watts. So it's able to output all that heat on this. And this laptop stays very cool. Even if it was to, you know, kind of turbo boost up to you know, the four gigahertz or whatever, it's still um, a very cool, very quiet processor. So I hope this video has helped you look at all this and be able to apply the motherboard concepts we've gone over. And I want this to be just less intimidating. I know the first time I opened up a laptop, I was like, what is going on? It just looks like stuff just barfed. It's like plastic and metal and copper, just like bleh. But there is some order to this and I want you guys to see that order and be able to appreciate it. And knowing these concepts will also help you better troubleshoot it and better be able to find the right laptop for your needs. Thank you all for watching and I would ask that you like, subscribe, and thank you for joining me on the motherboard series and just the channel as a whole where we learn about computers. Thank you, bye. Hello, my name is Josh. We've been talking about motherboards for a while and I want to show you that these concepts you're learning are not gonna be out of date in 10 years. Now, I wish I could show you computers 10 years in the future and I would love to see the chips and the components and the boards that are made but how about we go the other way? Let's go 40 years in the past and look at this. This is our Info 286. Let's get to it. So let's take a look inside. It's kind of hard to see a motherboard under any of this. So I'm gonna take some of that off for you and we'll look at it. So I pulled this out of there. This is a terrifying array of chips. And quite frankly, at a glance, I don't know what this does, <laughs> but it is pretty cool to look at, see all these chips. Um, they're actually removable. So if you got, you know, something to pry them out, you could replace them or, um, and then there's some dip switches up here. Just a monstrosity of a card. I'm glad things have gotten smaller. I really am. First concept I want to get across is the chipset. And we see four chips right here. And this is that company called Chips and Technologies that I mentioned in the chipsets video. So. They will handle all the communication between the CPU, any kind of RAM, and any kind of expansion slots. Um, they are right in the middle of everything, just directing, and they are also attached to the BIOS. BIOS is the next thing I want to talk about. It is right here. These are Phoenix BIOSes, and they are they're right there. They're, that's a BIOS. Yep. Another thing to mention about the BIOS here is that these these chips are a lot bigger than what we have nowadays. If you've seen in my BIOS video, I had a chip that held that I held on my finger. These are a bit, they're a bit bigger. <laughs> Get it? Bit, bit, bits and bytes. Okay. So I did mention that computers have buses. Every computer does. And in this one, we have some system buses, which is going to be the connection between this processor and our chipset. There is a bus to connect the BIOS to our chipset. And there is a bus that is connecting all of this RAM to the CPU or the chipset, wherever that goes. Um, this is some system buses. Some expansion buses are our 8-bit and our 16-bit ISA cards. ISA stands for Industry Standard Architecture. It's not really standard nowadays, but back then this card, it ruled. It ruled for a good 15, 20 years. And if you had a hard drive controller, you would put it in here. If you had a graphics card, you would put it in here. And if you had a, you know, simple, an, a serial expansion card, it would go in here. This computer actually really only has one peripheral bus and that's its keyboard connector back here. And we could say the floppy disk is a, a peripheral one as well, where it's accepting data from outside. But the keyboard one is really the only one that's baked into the board that's gonna to connect to another device. So on here we have some quartz crystals as I've gone over before with our real-time clock video. And we know that these will vibrate at a certain frequency. It actually has it posted right on them. 12 megahertz, 14 megahertz I'm guessing, 24 megahertz. And then over here, which I wanna make a note, I found this in here, which was like four AA batteries creating a six volt power source. I think this was like a, a modified real-time clock battery for this. I'm just gonna pull that out and uh, 
not touch those. And then over here, we see a, a traditional clock uh, quartz crystal right here. This and this are most likely gonna be the chips that were used for the real-time clock. Um, I'm not familiar with chips that are 40 years old, but it's the idea that there's a real-time clock and there's a chip that is keeping bio settings and counting up the time. I know I've talked to you guys about form factors and this one actually was one of the very first form factors and it is the XT form factor. So the first commercial one was called the PC form factor and then the XT form factor was released shortly after to correct some changes. And that can be figured out by looking at where these ISA slots are and figuring out where the designated space for memory goes and we can see some 8088 chips over here just doing some basic input output and um, also by the location of the keyboard input. Form factors are what determine you know where where the ISA slots go, where that goes, where the CPU goes. It determines where stuff goes and even back then back in 1983 they had an idea of a form factor. Manufacturers would want to follow this if they wanted parts to be compatible with this. So a manufacturer of a computer would want to follow this if they wanted any kind of support for extra peripherals, if they wanted to be able to put anything into these ISA slots, which you kind of wanted to for your computer to do anything. If you just have a keyboard and a floppy disk, it's kind of hard to see what you're typing. It's kind of hard to um, it's kind of hard to print something. It's kind of hard to just do anything. These ISA slots are important and having a standard of how far they are and how long they are. You know, this one, this one was extra long, but it has a support on the top of this. Like th this case was designed for that extra long card. And that wasn't done by accident. Someone went out of their way to make sure that this system fits that XT specification. Now we don't see XT form factors anymore. And nowadays we have the ATX standard. The ATX standard is kind of like a revision of all these past form factors. There was XT, there was PC, there was baby AT, there was AT, and you know, lots of form factors that we don't use. And we've probably never seen or will. Form factors. <laughs> the last concept that I want to briefly touch on in this video is system on a chip. I'm really fond of it. It's the idea of having less chips in a system. It's the idea of having more functionality, but having less stuff to do it. When I said back then, it looks like chips just barfed over the board. I wasn't exaggerating. I've shown you this. This is horrifying. This is my first day seeing this and it's going to give me nightmares. And I'm so glad we don't have that anymore. If I'm honest, I don't know what it does. And I don't have to know it because it's just gross and I don't really want to touch it. So this is the graphics card that came out of this. And well, it's not really impressive. There's some chips on it and it puts out a very low resolution output. This would probably be like 720, 480, 640, 480. Um, not HD and not cool, at least by today's standards. And uh, yeah. There's a lot of chips on there too. Let me show you what we have today. Yeah, not really today. I lied. This is from about 10 years ago, but still way better. We have a good heat sink on there. We have, you know, there's not chips everywhere. And it has support for three displays, two of them with HD capabilities. Like, wow. So for about the same amount of real estate, we get so much more performance with this card than we will ever get from this card or even a card from this generation. Really cool, I love to see how technology changes like this. I'm excited for the future too. I was told I needed to talk about the hard drive. It's a very big hard drive, very inefficient, and this would probably be like eight megabytes. It has multiple platters and it's heavy. This is a heavy piece of machinery right here. And quite frankly, I'm kind of scared to hold it. Thank you guys for watching and joining me on this series about motherboards and learning about them and learning about the concepts that go around them, such as standard specifications and the BIOS and how stuff works and is connected. 
Thanks for watching. Like and subscribe and follow me on this adventure as we learn about computers. Bye. What else do I say? Thanks for watching. Like and subscribe. Look for more videos. Bye. <laughs> so thanks for watching. What was I supposed to say? So thanks for watching. Are you? Are you recording? Heck. Drop a like. Subscribe. Ah. Ah. <laughs> <laughs>